Paul Cowra is a cardiologist in the south of England, um, uh, active, very active clinical investigator, as well practicing clinical cardiologist. So well placed to tackle perhaps uh, the topic in question. We'll see. Thank you very much. So in my hospital, we're frequently having discussions about changes to the uh, medical model of care. And there's always mutterings from other specialties, what are the cardiologists doing? And it always reminds me of a very famous scene uh, from a Monty Python film, The Life of Brian. And uh, I've adapted that scene to start the tour. We've got Reg, played by John Cleese, changed this to what have the cardiologists ever done for us? And of course, you can imagine the responses. They transform the uh, prognosis for patients with cardiovascular disease, with antiplatelet therapy, thrombolysis, primary angioplasty, RAS inhibition, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, MRAs and heart failure, beta blockers, ICD, CRT, and with major benefits on the quality of life. But Reg, of course, is a closet nephrologist. What about all these nephrotoxins they use, serum creatinine, AKI, and EGFR? And I hope to be able to persuade you over the next 20 minutes or so that the key benefits that cardiologists have had for patients with cardiovascular disease can be achieved with acceptable changes to renal function. Those are conflicts of interest. Cardiovascular disease is still a major cause of mortality in the Western world, uh, in the United Kingdom, accounted for somewhere between 25 to 30 percent of deaths. But we've made major inroads into the age standardized mortality rates for coronary heart disease and, and other aspects of cardiological disease over the last two decades. And the, these are data uh, from the BHF statistics. We can see with the top line in men and uh, for both and also for women, major reduction in age-standardized mortality over 20 years. And over a similar period of time, we've seen a major increase in the use of evidence-based uh, medicines directed towards improving the prognosis for patients. So uh, we've got the, the, the orange triangles being antihypertensives and heart failure drugs, the black triangles being lipid-lowering, primarily statins, and we've got antiplatelet drugs. As Phil alluded to, uh, I'm going to speak uh, primarily around heart failure here as an as exemplar, uh, on the grounds that this is the area where RAS inhibition has made probably the greatest uh, benefit sitting with heart failure with reduced ejection <laughs> fraction in terms of mortality and hospitalization. Um, but also it's the, probably the area within cardiology where we see the highest prevalence of CKD and perhaps the greatest changes in renal function. And this is the, 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 the trade-off that we're trying to um, get on top of and agree. And these are data from our National Heart Failure Audit. Phil has already shown you how good the nephrologists are at collecting data. Well, we're not too bad in cardiology either. We've had the, the MINAP uh, audit data set in the UK uh, for some considerable time. And then more recently, the Heart Failure Audit in England and Wales, where all secondary care trusts uh, submit data for, for uh, hospitalizations for heart failure. And what we see consistently is that who looks after these patients impacts on what happens to the patients. And here I've just highlighted that if you're uh, fortunate enough with heart failure to be uh, admitted to a cardiology ward, mortality is just over 6% as compared to almost 10% on a general medical ward and higher in an elderly care ward. And these are independent of other comorbid risk factors. It's not just about cardiologists, I'm going to uh, hasten to add here, that actually it's the delivery of care. And there are other uh, specialists involved in this, heart failure nurses, pharmacists as well. So actually, there are models of care where patients with heart failure uh, go to any ward, but are looked after by a roving team and uh, the spe with specialist input, then undoubtedly the outcomes are better. And when you try and tease out why that might be, and there will be confounding, of course, in this with comorbidities, actually, it does seem to relate to the use of evidence-based life-prolonging drugs, namely ACE inhibitors, uh, ARBs, MRAs, and beta blockers. And we see 
that if you can get patients on all three of those classes of drugs with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, then the mortality rates are much lower. And we've seen within heart failure over the last 30 years a massive change, certainly in clinical trials, of the prognosis for patients with reduced ejection fraction. And it's now just 31 years since consensus first published, and the one-year mortality rate for severe heart failure was 60%, which is remarkable. And we've seen the incremental benefit of ACE inhibitors, ARBs, beta blockers, MRAs, Drugs, uh, the, the drugs and then devices with ICDs, CRTs, and also the way we deliver care. But cardiologists haven't sat on their laurels here. They, they haven't sat on their laurels, and they've, they've gone and chosen their star center forward, the ACE inhibitor, and looked to see if they can get a better, better one in, in, in place of that. And actually here, we've got enalapril, the most evidence-based ACE inhibitor in heart failure, and uh, study uh, comparing this uh, randomized study with secubital valsartan, an ARNI, an angiotensin receptor neprilysin inhibitor, and we see a 20% risk reduction in uh, cardiovascular death and heart failure hospitalization with secubital valsartan, and a very similar reduction in mortality. And I want to draw your attention to the p-value. Now, if you had a p-value of 0 0.2, uh, the nephrologists and diabetologists start looking interested. If it's 0.02, they're positively drooling. And here we've got a p-value with six zeros in it. It's a really major, major difference to outcomes. And this hasn't come at a sacrifice of renal dysfunction. We can see here that actually the proportion of patients having a marked increase in serum creatinine is lower in the patients than succubital valsartan. And in fact, it was 0.7% of patients stopped their succubital valsartan because of renal dysfunction, and is 1.4% in the group on uh, in nalapril that stopped it. So it hasn't come at the expense of renal dysfunction. And in fact, whilst I've been showing you what's been positively happening in uh, cardiovascular care within the United Kingdom, what we haven't seen as an adverse consequence of this is a major change in the instant rates for renal replacement therapy. And Again, this is uh, the devolved, uh, these are the, the four nations uh, um, broken down. I'm going to focus on England because it's got the, the largest number of, of, of patients. So that's the, the white uh, circles. And you can see over the last eight to 10 years, there's been virtually no change in the incident rate. And these are very similar, uh, certainly in terms of the pattern for the US uh, data from the US RDS. So take a step back to a case now. So this is going back a, a couple of decades, uh, sitting on coronary care. Patients had thrombolysis, and they got lots of ventricular ectopics. And what we've known in cardiology for some time is, is the presence of ventricular ectopy post myocardial infarction is a very powerful adverse prognostic marker. And we've got lots of things that can suppress ectopics. So intuitively, one thinks suppress the ectopics, um, you're going to do better. And there was a famous study called the CAS study that is really important in the, this respect because this used drugs, uh, flecainide and nicanamide, that were very, very good at, uh, at uh, melting away ectopics. But unfortunately, the patients melted away with them as, as well. And there was a marked excess in mortality. And this is something I'm going to come back to a few times because if something is associated with bad outcomes, it doesn't mean to say that if you correct it, it's necessarily going to improve outcomes. And I think we've learned that uh, very well within cardiology. We know that chronic kidney disease is common in patients with cardiovascular disease, and particularly in heart failure. And we also know from repeated studies that uh, CKD, or worsening e EGFR, is associated with uh, increasing risk of outcomes. Here it's cardiovascular death and heart failure hospitalization from the CHARM study. And that, that increase in risk, particularly uh, goes up when the EGFR drops to less than 45. And that's independent of quite a number of other robust uh, risk markers in, in, in heart failure. What we've also learned, though, is that if patients have CKD, they're at real risk of adverse cardiovascular events and death, and they're far, far, far more at risk of those than they are at ending up with end-stage renal disease. 
And uh, the, the, the first part of this slide is, uh, is, is a follow-up of the study that Phil alluded to by Go and colleagues from the Kaiser Permanente data set, uh, where cardiovascular events and deaths far, far swamp the risk of progression onto end-stage renal disease. And that's very important to remember. So what about studies with uh, RAS blockers in heart failure that impact on renal function? So uh, a very important study called the RAL study uh, looked at spironolactone in severe heart failure, NYHA class 3 and 4, rejection fraction less than 35%, and uh, was associated with a, a significantly improved prognosis. And if we focus on the, the top left, on A, we see four lines. We see the, the top line, uh, and this is the risk of all-cause mortality, are, is, is looking at patients receiving placebo that had worsening renal function. And for this study, this is defined as um, a reduction in GFR of 30% or more from baseline to 12 weeks. And you can see that group does particularly badly. Below that, with the, uh, the, the grey uh, dotted line, there's no worsening renal function on placebo, and they have an intermediate bad outcome. What you do see, irrespective of whether you had worsening renal function or not with spironolactone, is that those patients did the best. And when you look at the, the forest plot for that on the, the right side, that actually there seems to be no adverse association with worsening renal function uh, when they're on spironolactone. That is, the net benefits are substantial with spironolactone. And we see a very similar pattern for death and heart failure hospitalization. And worsening renal function is more common on spironolactone than placebo. This is a bit of a complex slide. This is a meta-analysis from Clark and colleagues, but a couple of points to derive from this. And this was looking at five studies of RAS blockers in, in heart failure. And uh, again, the slight challenge here, the studies defined worsening renal function in slightly different formats. So one of the studies with a, a, an increase of... Uh, pattern in 0.3 grams per deciliter or more, and others by a reduction in GFR by 20 or 30 percent. And firstly, a comment to make is that worsening renal function, according to the study definitions, common if you're on a RAS blocker, is just over 13 percent. But something that I think is probably less well appreciated is it's mighty common in placebo, so it's almost 10 percent on placebo. And when you look down at the bottom uh, forest plot, this is looking at uh, the comparisons of patients with worsening renal function. The absolute magnitude of benefit of RAS blockers seems to be greater in the patients who, who are at higher risk, that is, they've had exhibited worsening renal function. So sometimes there's a trade-off that we have to accept for the greater good of the patient, and something that I would like to term net clinical benefit for the patient. So we can get away from cardiologists, get away from the title. If you're not going to trust a cardiologist, then who else are you going to trust? And here, two esteemed leaders um, who have, uh, you know, a complete, almost self-belief in themselves uh, founded on real no evidence. And uh, you've also got a, a leader perhaps allegedly uh, in, in involved in using uh, noxious drugs as well. And I'll leave it to you, the audience, to think about which camp the nephrologists fit in and which camp the diabetologists fit in for this. But let's see what the diabetologists have done over the last 20 years with some of their noxious drugs. Sorry, I, I went to so, so, put my thoughts press. So this is what the diabetologists have achieved over the last 20 years on the hard endpoints of cardiovascular uh, disease. So absolutely no difference on all-cause mortality, cardiovascular death, or non-cardiovascular death. And this is almost 30,000 patients. And in fact, it was the Accord study, a very large study, that looked to lower HbA1c to less than, than 6, that where there was an excess mortality uh, with, with that. I concede that over the last two or three years, there have been some positive studies uh, coming out um, with uh, drugs uh, treating patients with diabetes. So you'll have seen this yesterday, the Empereg, uh, study looking at the three-point uh, mace of cardiovascular death, non-fatal MI, and stroke, and 14% uh, reduction in the hazard ratio. However, I'm not totally convinced that this is explained by the change in HbA1c, and I'll come back to HbA1c in a moment. 
What about landmark studies in nephrology? Well, you probably expect me to click the button again, but uh, that, 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 that is the slide there. So, so, uh, uh, um, so, so uh, I, I, th I thought I'd hold back. I, I will click it again, actually. And, 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 and there, there are a few, there are a few, uh, few, few slides. There are a very important one, Astral, that Phil's already alluded to. And this, this NS, by the way, doesn't mean it was a non-starter like in a horse rate. This is non-significant, okay, for, for those that are used to seeing uh, p-values of, uh, of less than uh, 0 0.9. So um, these are the landmark studies in nephrologists. And one that I haven't put up there is a very important study uh, called the Beacon Study, which looked at a, which many of you may not have uh, been aware of, which looked at a drug called bardoxolone, which was first uh, discovered in the, the use of oncology, and it was found to be associated with an, uh, an improvement in renal function, so a reduction in serum creatinine and an increase in EGFR. And it was quickly uh, shoehorned into a, a large-scale outcome uh, study called the Beacon Study, published in the New England of Journal of Medicine five years ago, where it was evaluated in patients with type 2 diabetes and uh, uh, stage 4 CKD. And it does what it says on the tin, it does what it says on the packet, that is, it's associated with improvements in renal function. And that's got to be good for you, hasn't it? You'd intuitively think that, a bit like suppressing ventricular ectopy post-MI with flecainide. It's not. And we can see here, and if you're at the back, you probably think that I'm about to put a second Kaplan-Meier curve in. Well, actually, I'm not. They're overlying uh, each other there. So there was no different on the primary composite outcome of end-stage renal disease or cardiovascular death. Admittedly, the study was stopped early because of an adverse excess uh, cardiovascular risk with cardiovascular deaths and uh, the, the development of, of heart failure. So improving something that's bad for you doesn't necessarily mean that it, it improves outcomes for patients. So back to another little anecdote, and this is a lonely cardiology ward round a number of years ago, and I've been traipsing around since 8 o'clock it's now two o'clock. I'm feeling a little bit hungry, probably a bit hypoglycemic. That's without any drugs. And um, trying to get, walk through to my office, and uh, one of the nurses on CCU taps me on the shoulder and said, I'm really worried about the patient in, in bed one. Their breathing's pretty laboured. Now, it's lonely ward round because all of the junior doctors were on a leave for a lifelong learning course on how to reflect on reflection, which is very, <laughs> very, very positive. You know, very common thing in the, the UK, certainly. And um, so I, I, I was, I was c coming through this, and uh, the patient, I, I was relieved to see uh, that they'd already come through our medical assessment unit and they'd been clerked in, and there was a management plan in place. I wasn't starting completely afresh. And I went through the... And I, I was even more impressed that someone had put down a differential diagnosis, actually, in, in, in this. And it came out that the patient had got heart failure, and I think, well reasonably comfortable in managing heart failure. Atrial fibrillation, great. Well, I can manage atrial fibrillation to a degree as well. And then I was thunderstruck because this term came in, Aki, and I'd never heard of Aki at this, this time point. And I, and I was dumbstruck by what Aki was. So I thought I'd go in to find out what was happening to this poor old patient in the, in the side room. And it's a typical Portsmouth patient with decompensated heart failure. So firstly, they had pitting edema up to their knees. They had two right legs. And uh, <laughs> they, um, <laughs> they uh, had an elevated venous pressure, so their ears, ears were waggling. What, stu what uh, really stunned me, however, was the fact that they had a venflon in their anticubital fossa on the right side, and they were connected to a bag of fluids and some antibiotics. And this was part of the new Aki pathway that had been brought in. And now, fortunately for this patient with a laboured breathing, the fluid seemed to be going into their arm as quickly as it was frothing out of their mouth, actually. And, and the, the first thing I did to stop the waterboarding of the patient was obviously to, to stop the drip and, and to give them some uh, rather old medicine called a loop diuretic, irrespective of Aki. And what's really crucial, I think what we're learning in, in, in decompensated heart failure is the importance of decongesting. This is really, really important for both the patient and for the patient's kidneys. This is a nice study by Metra and colleagues uh, looking at patients with decompensated heart failure. And they're grouped according to 
whether they develop worsening renal function during their admission, which is a, an increase in serum creatinine of 26 micromoles per litre or 0.3 grams per deciliter uh, or, or more, and whether or not they're discharged home with features of congestion, typically uh, peripheral edema. And what we can see on the left-hand side, on the Kepler mic, is looking at death and heart failure uh, transplantation. The group that does, does worst is the group in red, which is those that develop worsening renal function and still had congestion at discharge. The group that was sort of in the middle had no worsening renal function, but went home with a degree of congestion. Actually, the near overlapping lines at the top were the best outcomes with the patients that went home decongested, irrespective of whether they had worsening renal function or not. And a very similar um, pattern when you look at heart failure uh, readmission, and there's a number of studies um, that have shown very similar findings. If you look at it the other way around, what happens to patients with decompensated heart failure when their renal function improves during their admission? So that is the serum creatinine goes down or the EGFR goes up. And these are data uh, from the DOSE study, which was a, a study looking at different regimes of IV diuretics from high-dose uh, um, infusions of diuretics or boluses of diuretics. And there was quite a, 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 an aggressive step up in, in uh, diuretics uh, with both increased in loop diuretics with the addition of, of thiazide diuretics. And it was looking at um, change in GFR here in, in, in this study from baseline to 72 hours and then the composite risk of death, rehospitalization, or an, an ED visit within 60 days. And a relatively small study, 300 patients. But what you can see is the patients that had improvement in renal function here by an increase in GFR had a much higher risk of these adverse events, uh, whereas actually there was no significant difference if there was a reduction in GFR. And I, I do note that there are relatively small numbers of patients um, at the extremes of this. However, this does, I think, fit in with the fact that the patients here, are, whilst there's a number of plausible mechanisms why this might happen, that they've probably been under diuresed and they've had their RAS blockers, in my opinion, inappropriately stopped. Now, Room 101 was first introduced by George Orwell in his uh, famous uh, novel, 1984. And in the United Kingdom, for those of you that aren't familiar with this, this has been developed into a, a bit of a chat show um, that's on TV once a week. And in fact, guests are given the opportunity to rid the world of their pet hates. And I was thinking about what I, as a cardiologist and as a heart failure specialist, would like to put into room 101. I thought about putting HbA1c into room 101, but I thought, actually, it is a really powerful prognostic mark, and we should probably keep that, but just make sure that people only measure it once only. I thought about putting Aki into room 101, but actually, I, I, I think Aki, it, it does identify a higher risk patient, and I bought into that. But what I think we just need to really get the message across is examine the patient and make a clinical decision, decision based on the patient, not respond to the blood test. So I've kept them out of room 101. However, sick day rules is the first thing that goes in there. And I don't know if many of you have come across this from outside the UK, but sick day rules have been championed in various parts of the UK where patients who are on a number of different drugs, get given a little card and are told after we've spent months and months optimizing their ACE inhibitor dose, their MRA dose, which isn't just a diuretic, of course, it's a disease-modifying, uh, life-prolonging uh, drug, drugs in, in, in heart failure. We've encouraged the patients to progressively uh, up-titrate these drugs, and when they feel a little bit peaky, we tell them they can stop them because they're bad for them at that stage. And then the thought that the patients are going to restart them and get to the same drugs, to me, is, uh, it, it is unlikely to be the case. And I think we have very little evidence base on which to be um, uh, taking this forward. The other thing that bugs me is the use of the term nephrotoxin applied to, to, to RAS blockers. And this is taken from Wessex, Adult uh, Acute Kidney Injury Pathway for Primary Care, I appreciate it's medication and toxins, but this is being picked up on by many, many individuals, and it's frequently put that please stop nephrotoxins when there's a, you know, a creatinine goes from 100 to 102 because of uh, 
um, some, some danger to the, the kidneys. And I think this is something that we must get, get away from. So uh, certainly um, sick day rules and the term nephrotoxins. And these are the same beastly nephrotoxins, of course, that have uh, transformed the prognosis for patients with heart failure. And remarkably, when I've done a little bit of fishing around in, in patients with renal disease, it's about the only thing that's ever been shown to slow down the rate of progression of, of kidney disease. Here, a data from IDNT study uh, looking at herbosata compared to amlodipine compared to placebo, reducing the, the rate of uh, doubling of serum creatinine or development of end-stage renal disease, something that was reproduced with uh, Lasartan and the renal study. So nephrotoxins that are good for your kidneys. However, I do think we're better together. So coming on to the, the, the final couple of slides, I think we should be working cohesively together. And there's a number of examples of where we're making progress with this in the UK. So the, the Renal Association, uh, Think Kidneys and the British Society for Heart Failure have worked very hard and, and cohesively together to come up with some pragmatic guidelines. And this has been really, really driven by Charlie Thompson, who's, who's here, and it's been a pleasure working with him over the, the last couple of years to get these uh, pragmatic position statement ag agreed to help um, uh, come to a consensus so that we're providing all singing from the same hymn sheet. And part of this really differentiates when you're using the RAS blockers, when you're using them for a, a majorly beneficial prognostic indication, for example, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, to me is very different to when you're using them for another indication like heart failure with preserved ejection fraction or hypertension, where there are other options to treat the patients and you may accept, you may not be willing to accept a deterioration in, in renal function. And we've worked to it very cohesively together. And there's another piece we're working on that we've almost agreed, and I'd rather hope we would have it finally signed off by the time of this meeting, but this is RAS, Renal Function Heart Failure, and this is guidance from the Renal Association of the British Society for Heart Failure and it's a pragmatic recommendations for the management during titration, what to do in an intercurrent illness, particularly in the con in the, in, within decompensated heart failure. And again, this is working with, with Charlie Thompson, Paddy Mark, Laurie Tomlinson, Mark Petrie and Andrew Clark. And, and it's been a challenge to get agreement towards this. It's going through the various societies. You can see I've, put the, I've highlighted a little bit of this in yellow, and that's because we're still, of course, puffing our chests out, deciding who's going to go first uh, within, within the title of, of, of this. And uh, I think that it's the 20th anniversary today of the Good Friday Agreement, so when the peace process in Northern Ireland came together. And I rather hope we'll be having, in 20 years' time, celebrations of the cardiorenal agreement in the United Kingdom, where we've come together. And I think if Charlie and I manage to pull this off, we're, we're rather expecting an invitation from the UN to go out to uh, the, 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 the sort of Middle East to sort that out next, but we, we will see. We've had cohesive working in developing research projects. This is a study that I'm leading called uh, Ironman, which is looking at intravenous iron in heart failure uh, on, on an endpoint of uh, cardiovascular mortality and, and recurrent heart hospitalization for heart failure. And this has been vital, having nephrologists and cardiologists working together. So finally, if not a cardiologist, who else would you entrust, of course? And this is when, luckily, following my brother, I'm in the advantage here. So you may recognize this individual. This is George Best, probably one of the world's best ever footballers. And here you can see a real cocky, budding nephrologist here. And you know that he's a cocky, budding nephrologist. This is Phil, who was a very good footballer is because he's the only one of these boys offering his autograph to George Best. <laughs> and, uh, and, 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 and um, you can see, just, just look at, just focus on George Best's haircut, because this is Phil a few years later on, actually. And, and he wonders why he didn't have the same success with Miss World, actually, as, uh, as, as George. But would, would you trust your patience to this man, is what, is what I ask. So in conclusions, uh, from my perspective, treat the patient and not the test. Careful clinical assessments, fundamental. And remember that in heart failure, congestion is really bad for patients, and it's really bad for your kidneys. Some deterioration in renal function on initiation of, of RAS blockers is acceptable and may well identify a higher risk group of patients with a greater absolute benefit of the therapy 
uh, to, to, to be gained. And I think we need to look at the net clinical benefit to the, the patient. RAS blockers aren't ne nephrotoxic and cohesive working between specialists will hopefully improve the outcomes for all of our patients. So thank you very much.